You gotta sit closer to me. We wanna hold hands during the hard parts. Um, and there will be hard parts, I'm sure. Um, when you first, you know, uh, Patty used the, the sugar water line. So that was something that you held in your hand. There's a can of sugar water, right? Um, you've sort of gone back to that because you're, 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 you're now in the smartphone business. But when you first started selling uh, computers, how big was it? That, let's see, what year did you start at Apple? Well, I joined Apple in the beginning of 1983. Right, correct. And I was really brought to Apple, I didn't know anything about computers, um, but I was brought to Apple uh, because the Apple II was aging, and Steve Jobs was uh, almost two years away from launching the Mac. But show me with your hands, how big was? Well, well the uh, Apple, let's, let's take the Mac as a simpler yeah. example. It had 3.5 megahertz processor. <laughs> Now, there isn't anything that is sold or used today that has 3.5 megahertz, um, because everything is you know, thousands of times more powerful than that. So if you, if you put it into today's context, uh, in 2008, there were about 800 exabytes of data. And an exabyte is uh, 10 to the 18th, or you might describe it in a more visual way if you took uh, a CD and filled it up with as much data as you could and put uh, as many CDs as you could into a 747 aircraft, uh, you'd need 15,447 747s filled with uh, Not to DVDs. Put too and fine and of that's a point on just it. for one exabyte. Well, there were 800 exabytes in 2008. The estimate is that by 2018, now it's 10 years later, uh, there'll be 40,000 exabytes of data. So it just gives you a, an idea that uh, the speed at which technology is growing is exponential. Well, one of the things that might happen is more and more things become uh, con connected. You know, my shoes are connected right now. Uh, watch is connected. Everything's uh, connected. Do, do we really have the bandwidth? Do, can we really accommodate well, all the data that we're going to start making? I mean, pretty soon my heart is going to become part of the cloud, right? Well, I think a lot of people here have probably heard about the Internet of Things. And John Chambers, who's the CEO of Cisco, has said this is the next really big thing in technology. And he has forecasted that by the early 2020s, there'll be 40 billion wireless connected devices um, now Wait, these, though, how many people are there in the world? Seven billion? There's seven billion people, 40 billion wireless connected devices. I came into Silicon Valley at the beginning of the microprocessor. This is the beginning of sensors. Um, and sensors are going to be mostly machine-to-machine -machine communications. And what are those machines going to do? They're going to machine learning. And machine learning shifts the whole balance from computers as tools, and that's what we've known for 30 years. It's really a common mission by every high-tech company has been computers as tools for knowledge workers. Now we're moving into an era where the computer becomes not artificial intelligence as smart as a human, but smart enough, David, to do maybe 60, 70 percent of what a lot of skilled people do. So it's going to lead to the reinvention of almost every skilled job that you can think of in the middle management uh, layers of organizations all over the world in every industry. It's, it's, it's really one of the, these fundamental moments that is going on. And it's why I wrote a book called Moonshot to talk about not the technology, there are a lot of people who can talk about the technology better than I can, but to talk about what are the big implications of something like that happening. Well, if you, in, in, one of the things that technology does really well is make jobs go away. I mean, I, we're, we're going to end up with a really smart world, a really productive world, where a lot of people are left at the table. I know I, I don't want to bring the bummer to, in front of all these technologists, but what, at what point is technology going to invite uh, the human race to the table and make sure that, you know, uh, 
I, I just worry as, as, as the world becomes smarter and smarter that there's going to be a lot of people left out of it. Yeah, well, we, we do somehow have this uh, assumption that uh, there'll always be a job for someone who's qualified to do the work, and the reality is that technology is going to eliminate a lot of jobs. But uh, I think about it as really a problem that does have something we can do about it. And governments don't create jobs for the most part. Large companies don't create jobs. The only place jobs are created are by small companies, more typically entrepreneurial companies. So I believe that it may not solve the entire issue you raised. I mean, that's such a huge societal issue. But uh, if there's any one thing we can do, it's to help entrepreneurs go out and create new businesses, because that's where new jobs are going to come, whether it's in North America, here in Europe, Asia, wherever it is in the world, you know, entrepreneurs are going to become more and more important to society because they're going to be the ones creating the jobs. Ba back when um, you and Steve were working together, did you ever envision the world we're living through right now? I mean, things are happening. He was fond of saying, you know, change comes very slowly, then all at once, right? Well, well here, here's what might surprise people. Uh, I was in many conversations uh, with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Remember, they were in their 20s. Right. And there was one thing they completely agreed on, and that was what they called the noble cause. And the noble cause was we're going to uh, change the world by making computers personal. Remember, the idea of personal computers was a completely outrageous idea 30 years ago. Uh, in fact, Ken Olson, the CEO and founder of Digital Equipment, said, why would individuals want their own computers? And then they said, we've got to create tools for the knowledge workers. And Bill Gates invented shrink wrap software. And then they said, we're going to change the world one person at a time. And to me, as a marketing guy coming out of mass marketing, I didn't at first know what they were even talking about. Now, in not one of the many conversations that I had with Steve and Bill, did anyone ever talk about making money? It was always about thinking about the societal impacts of changing the world with a noble cause. By the way, after that idea, they argued over everything. I mean, they were in constant uh, uh, argument about entirely different strategies, how to accomplish that, that noble cause. But Steve Jobs, even back in 19... Uh, 84, uh, he was working on the idea of a phone. And Steve uh, might surprise people. He was not technical, uh, he was, but he was brilliant. And he had this ability to connect dots from different domains. He was a more his, of a marketer like you are. He was a designer. Okay. Now, that's, uh, what brought Steve and me together was I had studied industrial design. He loved design. Uh, he loved what we were doing with the Pepsi challenge, felt that computers sh should be sold like com uh, consumer products as we were doing in the Cola Wars. And that's kind of what brought us together. I didn't know anything about computers. And I was later discovered that he wasn't particularly technical, but he had an amazing ability to recruit talent, an amazing ability to see where things were going. And I have a simple definition for a genius. It's seeing the obvious 20 years ahead of the rest of us. And he had that ability to kind of see where it was going. So the ideas that, that uh, the world later saw Steve bring out in, um, let's say, the late 1990s, then in 2007 with the iPhone, I mean, he was thinking about these kinds of ideas you know, all the way back in the early 1980s. One of the things that allowed Apple to end up being a company that sold you know, seven, eight billion dollars worth of computers, is you were able, through marketing, to position your company as an underdog, right? And that smashing the establishment and the famous Super Bowl commercial. And, you know, the thing is, we still kind of root for Apple and we still kind of see them as scrappy when, in fact, they've got the largest market cap on the planet. What, that's a pretty good campaign you ran on their behalf. Well, I think uh, when you have a great company like that, uh, it's, the values and the directions almost always come from the founder. Mm -hmm. And the thing I did not appreciate, remember I came from corporate America. Right. Um, 
and Steve was in his 20s, and he didn't have much experience running companies. Uh, so you can be brilliant, but you're not automatically experienced. And it, it wasn't until, you know, after Steve had left, um, and, and as anyone who read the Walter Isaacson book knows, I didn't actually fire Steve. It was, it was a whole series of other events. But, but after Steve left, it became apparent to me that, that losing the founder uh, is, is really devastating to a company unless you can keep the founder's values and the founder's strategy. So even during the decade that I was at Apple, and we did grow the business uh, by 10 times to by 1,000%, and we were the largest selling hardware PC in the world, um, and then I got fired. And the reality is that... Tough uh, racket there, computers. Hey, that's, it's, it's like you know, being a, you know, in, in this, on a, leading a sports team and you have a bad season and you get fired and you go somewhere else and you get successful again. But, but Silicon Valley is a cowboy world, as, as some people probably know. But the brilliance <laughs> of a founder makes all the difference. I mean, look at Elon Musk, you know, look at... Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, look at uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, these guys, they don't make every decision right. Um, but founders get a little more latitude than the rest of us. And as I think back to Steve leaving, as I said, he wasn't fired. Uh, he was demoted because uh, he, he wanted to do some things that the board uh, and I didn't think made any sense, and then he eventually resigned. But, the, but we should have given him more latitude, given more latitude to him as a founder, because he was always brilliant. He was not always a great manager, but he was, he was always brilliant. And so founders, I think, are really key. Uh, it's why entrepreneurial companies you know, become great and have sustainability. Uh, even when a founder is gone, Steve has left Apple, obviously, but the, the, the values and the strategies of Apple really aren't any different than the ones that uh, I learned working with Steve 32 years ago. Well, if he didn't get, get fired, which has been called the most famous human resources decision in the history of the universe, he did get shoved to the side. Why did he get pushed? What was going on? I, I know this is ancient history, but all things Steve are super interesting. So was, was he just spending money like a madman? Was he going down an avenue that wasn't going to yield product that could be sold? What, what mistake was he making? You know, uh, as I said it earlier, Steve was not an engineer. Right. Uh, as brilliant as he was, uh, Steve had what we used to uh, almost jokingly call a reality distortion field. Right. And, and that was a well-known term associated with, with Steve in Silicon Valley. And by that was his ambitions were so visionary that he would get ahead of what the technology could really do. And in 1985, when we launched the Macintosh office, which was ultimately renamed uh, a couple of years later, Desktop Publishing, uh, the idea was brilliant. But the problem was, in 1985, <laughs> Moore's Law, the processors just weren't powerful enough to run a laser printer and to run the graphics on the screen. And when Steve introduced it to great fanfare, it was a flop. And he went into because a depression. Because it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, and it was called Other than a, that, it was great, though. But it, it, it laid the foundation for where it was all going. And here's the irony of, of it all. First, Steve said, uh, we've got to lower the price by $500. And we've got to shift some marketing from the Apple II over to the, to the uh, Macintosh office. And I said, Steve, if we do that, we're going to drive the company into a loss. And we've got to tell the board. Um, and he said, well, you wouldn't dare do that, would you? Uh, I'm chairman. And I said, watch me. And so we went to the board and presented our cases. And the board asked the third co-founder, Mike Markla, who was the vice chairman of the board, to study it. He reported back to the board about eight days later and said, I agree with John, not with Steve. And Steve was asked by the board to step down from the Mac division. He was never fired from Apple. But the point there is that he was absolutely correct about where it was going because right. a year later, 1986, the microprocessors were now powerful enough to do what they couldn't do in 1985. We reintroduced a Macintosh Office as desktop publishing. Uh, we had learned a lot about how to market it, and guess what? It, turned out to be really successful, and that was still Steve's idea. It wasn't my idea, that was his idea. Did you guys ever get a chance to hug it out? 
No, no Steve uh, never forgave me. And uh, you know, we, we did meet and we never talked. Neither one of us have ever talked about it uh, since then. But um, you know, he was really hurt. Apple was his life. It was like um, you know, losing um, the leadership of Apple uh, was, was a very painful thing for him, obviously. Let's talk about the current context, which is we're in a sea of entrepreneurship here. And there's just, you can feel the throb coming off the audience and his barriers to entry. I mean, for you guys to make Mac, yeah, it, it, to make Apple, it started in a garage, but it had to scale. Now the barriers to entry are down. You don't need, um, you can make things with a couple of friends and you can make things that might end up changing the world. What becomes expensive is attention. And I know that as a reporter at the summit, my, my inbox looks like a nuclear waste dump. I haven't, I'm sorry I haven't returned some of your emails, but what everybody is looking for a way to stick out again and again. And so as somebody who wrote a book on entrepreneurship, is it just, if you build it and it's great, it, it will come? Or how do, you, how do you create inbound interest when you've got thousands and thousands of great ideas? Well, here's how I think about it. And the, the, the reason I wrote a book was I get about 150 unsolicited uh, LinkedIn messages every day from entrepreneurs saying, can I just have 15 minutes with you? Or can, will you look at my business plan? And it's just not possible to uh, do that physically. But what I observe, I, I'm not an engineer, but I've been around technology for a long time. And I'm focused on what you can do with technology, the implications of it. And what I observed, David, was that we are in this tsunami of technologies. It isn't just one person creating a moonshot. Moonshot's a metaphor in Silicon Valley of, you know, whatever happens after is never going to be the same as what was bef before, like um, founding Google or the Apple iPhone or, you know, Tim Berners-Lee uh, creating the World Wide Web. Those were, were moonshots. The moonshot that I wrote about in my book, Moonshot, is that there's been a power shift in the marketplace from incumbent large established companies with long relationships uh, with their customers to now the customers are in control. And by that I mean that the customers are paying more attention to what other customers have to say, product ratings, referrals, link messages, or customers join communities of interest that the power shift to customers suddenly being smarter because of big data analytics, listening more to other customers, is creating the possibility of every industry uh, in every part of the world, whether it be B2B or B2C, being completely rethought on a different set of parameters. One parameter is these, this uh, tsunami of technologies, cloud, mobility, uh, Internet of Things, unstructured data analytics, is enabling us to amp up the customer experience to a level that we had never seen before. I mean, the experience on Amazon is dramatically different than anyone ever saw on e-commerce. And look at Alibaba, and look at you know, all kinds of examples of just great customer experience. At the same time, those same technologies are enabling us to uh, go through what uh, is called in Silicon Valley digitization, which means to digitize all work processes and drive down the cost of delivery of products and services. So you can have disruptive price, amped up customer experience, and it really is a game change. And what really makes it interesting for entrepreneurs, this stuff's really cheap. I mean, the affordability of getting on the cloud, uh, go to AWS, Amazon Web Services, and with your credit card, you, know, you can get access to, to, the, to the cloud. Um, people are starting businesses that are getting the network effect and they are scaling you know, at you know, matters of months, what used to take uh, decades. So it's a completely different opportunity. Yeah, but you're a marketing guy and that still doesn't address how you get people to pay attention to you. How do you become the one thing in the 150 unsolicited LinkedIn where you go, hmm, mm. Hmm. It, it's, it's all about customer experience. And if you can't engage a customer, 
with something they want, uh, something they really appreciate, appreciate so much that they want to tell other customers about it, isn't going to work. It, our world's too cluttered. You just can't break through the clutter. So, so you look at the, at the services that, that break out. I mean, how does WhatsApp, uh, which was less than five years old, you know, had 56 employees, get sold for $21.9 billion to Facebook, which I think was actually a pretty good deal for Facebook, even though it had no revenue. You know, why? Because customers loved the experience of WhatsApp, and it's just been scaling like crazy because other customers tell other customers, and they use it, and it just keeps passing on and on. Yeah, that's the world we live in. If, um, so you have, you're getting in the phone business, right? What's going to make that phone stick out? Price? Functionality? Well, we, we started a um, mobile smartphone business. Uh, we launched it over in Asia. I, was, I just came in from Hong Kong this morning. Uh, we launched it in, in Singapore this last week. I was in, in uh, the Middle East two weeks earlier. And what we're doing is we're saying <laughs> we can put together a great Silicon Valley team. In fact, I took some of my former Apple uh, you guys. You picked and, Apple's pocket. No, it has, we are in a totally different business than Apple's in. Apple's in beautiful, high-end phones. Everyone aspires to an iPhone. We introduced a product called Obi, but instead of selling at six or $800 without wireless carrier subsidies, you know, we can sell at $100 to $150. Why? Because technology is totally commoditized. So how do you differentiate? You bring in the best design team you have. So I brought in a lot of my former Apple uh, colleagues, the head of design before Johnny Ives, the, the chief marketing officer of Apple when I was there and some others, and we are designing the best products we can, but sell them at a price that Apple has no interest in selling products at, which is in that $100 to $150 price point, and to take that just to the emerging markets, aiming at young people, teenagers, and early 20s, who are getting their first smartphone ever, and uh, creating an experience with marketing and services around it, uh, which we think can be appealing. But these are markets that are going through rapid changeover from feature phones to smartphones. If we tried to do this two years later, we'd probably fall on our face. Why? Because someone else would have filled that gap. John, what amazes me is guys like you never stop trying to take over the world. There's, again and again, there's always the next, and I think it's uh, great that you stop by and talk to these guys, all of whom want to take over the world in their own way and, 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 and shared your experience in, in, at, both at Apple and what you've Well, here, here's, here's the message, I think. Uh, I don't do the heavy lifting anymore. I don't run companies. Um, but I believe in mentoring. And so I work with about, I guess, we have about 18 companies, all, all told. And I'm a founder of a number of them, and I try to do things like uh, open doors, bring in the money, give another point of view on things. And so mentoring is something you can do. You don't have to retire just because you get old. You can actually stay alive and be active. And it's a great world out there. And it's still a lot of people are going to create a lot of great businesses so, ahead. So John's in the mentoring business. Let's keep an eye out for this guy. Thank you all for your attention and your time, John.